You are listening to Medicine and the Machine with Medscape Editor-in-Chief Eric Topol and Master Storyteller and Clinician Abraham Verghese as they talk with experts around the globe about the hottest topics in healthcare. This podcast is intended for U.S. healthcare professionals only. Hello, I'm Eric Topol for Medicine and Machine Medscape with my co-host Abraham Verghese. And we have a really uh, terrific uh, session today uh, with um, uh, Dr. Judy Gichoa from Emory University, who is a radiologist as well as an informatician or data scientist. She has a remarkable background. She um, had her medical degree at Moi University in Kenya, went on to a master's in science at Indiana University and Purdue, Purdue University did her diagnostic radiology at Indiana University, then went on to Oregon Health Science University for uh, interventional radiology, and now joined the faculty um, uh, recently in recent years at Emory. Uh, notably, uh, since I follow um, Aunt Minnie, uh, the number one website radiology, she was named the 2021 researcher uh, of the year for radiology. Um, and today, in particular, we want to talk about what I consider uh, one of the most important papers of AI that's been published by Judy and her colleagues uh, recently in Lancet Digital Health. So, Judy, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Well, uh, just to get started, um, the, the recent paper that you had of medical imaging being able to detect race. Uh, is, is extraordinary. It builds on a paper uh, or a few papers that showed how retinal imaging can pit, detect gender quite accurately. Uh, in fact, retinal experts can only pick up gender from a photo 50%, whereas the deep learning uh, gets 97% accuracy. This wasn't anticipated. So can you give us the background of the study and kind of your, your uh, impressions? No, Eric, I would like to have a big, majestic story telling you how I was inspired to work on this, but really it was an accident. And, um, you know, like any academician, you may not appreciate this because you're a prolific writer, but uh, we got a reject because, um, you know, two years ago, if you were sort of looking at the special issues that were coming out, they were mainly focused on social justice in addition to COVID and, you know, trying to talk about systemic racism that we, you know, the sort of like all the issues that were affecting us, uh, thinking about systemic racism. And so the Journal of American College of Radiology had a special issue to talk about bias in medical imaging. And, you know, I was like, yeah, you know, this is a good time. I participated in a datathon in, you know, the previous year with some students from Singapore. And I realized that the chest x-ray data set for the MIMIC data set was very underutilized. So, and I said, why don't we look at this problem from this public data set? You know, I went, browsed, and found some of the earlier work that had been done by, you know, a team from Toronto who are now our collaborators and friends. And they'd shown, you know, we have very high rates of underdiagnosis when you look at the 14 test X-ray labels uh, in the data set. And this was done on the MIMIC data set. So, you know, when I found out that work had been done on that, I went back and said, okay, why don't we look at the MRE data set that has, you know, an equal population of 50, 50 uh, percentage of blacks and whites. And so when I went back to Emory, you know, I wrote to the, to the authors and said, hey, let's repeat your study with Emory data. And here, the, you know, I was already seeing what the, the conclusion would be is, let's publish more diverse data sets. It's going to solve bias. And so uh, unfortunately, when we ran the preliminary results, we saw that uh, the amplitude went down. So if you're looking at the, you know, the false uh, pro positive rate, whatever fairness 360 metric that you chose, it went down, but it wasn't eliminated. So that was very concerning for us. So in the process, we started collect, you know, sort of having these uh, discussions about what could be going on. We had already given the model diverse data, data sets, but we weren't seeing the bias completely eliminated. And so one of our collaborators, Pochi from Taiwan, came back and said, hey, uh, 
these data set, these models are learning the patient's race as the with in part, you know, as part of their prediction. And you know, we shamed him and said, oh, of course not, you made a mistake, go back. We even took you know the code and ran it from a different person and persistently we found this. So now the project changed. We had already been rejected for, you know, from our abstract to submit this work. And but you know, now we were excited and started working on uh, what could be causing, is this is this real and what could be causing it? And we obviously thought some of the discussions that we've had were maybe this is confounders, maybe these models, all the black patients are sick, they have, you know, cardiomegaly and this is what the model is learning. And, you know, uh, I don't want to rush to the end of the podcast, which is to say we haven't found the reason why, although this performance is, you know, represents superhuman ability. So it's a happy accident, but amazing group of collaborators that led us to ask and answer this question. Um, Dr. Kuchoya, welcome to, to the program. Uh, um, I must confess that I'm, I'm not a math or computer person, which is probably why I'm in medicine. I have brothers who are in, in math, but this might be a very naive question, but um, in a way, it, it seems to me a blessing in disguise in the sense that if AI uh, makes out race, the consequences aren't, aren't as apparent as, say, with you know, housing loans or mortgage refinance, and where clearly the provider's bias on the previous data sets is creeping in. Uh, is that the same problem here that we might anticipate? So... Uh, this is a this is a great question. Why why does this matter? And you know, just to first of all answer the question you didn't ask is to say, I think the whole project. One of the things that I learned is the importance of communicating new science. And you know, uh, and and this is because this work straddles between clinicians and computer scientists. And so the computer scientists the mathematicians, they want a simple pro problem. They want you to say, this case is biased and I'm going to work on my math and fix it. And so why does race matter? Now we understand even just without algorithms that race matters in terms of pain outcomes, in terms of you know, maternal mortality, but this ability for the AI models to see your self-reported race in medical imaging, at least in our research, is important for two things. One, because we cannot really understand why. If, and that may be okay because I'm a radiologist. I don't really understand how MRIs work, but I understand when they fail. So maybe the question is to move away from trying to understand why, to understand when it matters. And then the second thing is when we change the medical images so that I can just show you a gray image and tell you this was a chest X-ray because we're applying different filters to them, the AI models still have this ability and at a surprising good performance, better than humans, which tells us that, you know, if you show me five images of, of a skin prediction algorithm and it doesn't work, I can say, well, this belong to dark skin patients. In this case for radiology, you really cannot tell because it's an ability that we radiologists, when we randomly tried to do this task, were performing random at 50 to 55%. And so uh, I think, but at the same, on the other hand, we see two algorithms that we've actually worked on. One is the Mirai algorithm from Harvard that says, uh, just give me the breast, uh, the image, the mammogram image, and I'm going to tell you the three and the five year breast cancer risk for this patient. I don't need to look at any clinical information. And you start to see these models perform way better than even the Tara Kruzik model or the Gale models for black patients. So it's something exciting. And then the second work is the osteoarthritis prediction algorithm from Ziad Obamaya, which also just looks at the knee image and grades and correlates it to the pain score and gets better. So while all those words are to say, this is a mess, we don't understand when it hurts and when it helps, but we that's where the science needs to go. And truly uh, it's still very early to figure out why does this matter? But what I can say, the simplistic approach of the computer scientists, the mathematicians wanting to have one use case for them to solve is too simplistic to understand, to make, you know, to be able to harness the power of AI, at least for image-based models moving forward. You mentioned uh, that you did uh, saliency maps and try to unravel, deconstruct the model to see if you could find features that would help to understand how it's detecting race, but you couldn't find anything. Is that right? Yes, we couldn't find anything. And not just saliency maps. 
and also you had across many different types of imaging, as you mentioned, chest X-rays, CT scans, uh, mammograms. I'm trying to remember all the different types of images. And you did you have um, any uh, confirmation also in Asian ancestry? So the MRE data set do not have a big population of Asians, but the Stanford data sets do actually. And subsequently we have been able, this is work that's ongoing. We've been, we are in a partnership of eight uh, federated learning centers where we are doing the same work again. And some of those centers are, one is in India, one is in Taiwan. And uh, what's interesting actually in our preliminary just in France. So what was surprising for a model is I could send it to you. You don't need to fine tune it. You don't need to train it. You just run the inference and you have 90, you know, 94, 95%, you know. And so that was very surprising because, you know, we, as usually when you bring a model to new data, the performance drops. And so when we took it and someone had a Japanese cohort and they tested it, the performance was terrible. It was like 20%. That's the only time, and we never had enough data, which is why we went to this federated learning model to figure out why. Um, we, when it was tested on the Taiwanese population, it was good. What we haven't been able, and people have suggested this, is true, we look at uh, you know, the race of Black or African-Americans, but it's also very heterogeneous, especially like I'm from the African continent, and you know, till, would we have a difference or a drop in performance? So that drop, people suggested that if you look at the performance of prior, prior failures of maybe pulse oximeters, it could be an equipment and calibration mechanism. And maybe that's what's happening and causing this phenomenon, but we, we really don't know. You know, in Eric's, uh, in Eric's last book, um, in that last chapter, AI, uh, AI was featured heavily in Eric's conclusion. I'm, Eric, I'm quoting your your words to say that in a way, AI plus humans is going to be a formula that's really going to make us much more astute clinicians and connectors than AI alone or humans alone. Am I, am I saying that correctly, uh, Eric? But I'm not yet seeing the full application of that partnership of humans with AI. We seem to see these pure AI papers, you know, and they're handed over to people like me who are much more sort of patient-centered. Where do these two streams come together to make us better at doing what we do? Um, so there is the technical answer to that question, and then there's the sort of reality answer to that question. So most of the acceleration in terms of AI has been driven by you know funding, VC funding. And some of the companies, I think, Start off with ex domain experts and then drop them off. You know, trying to accelerate to you know fail often. You know your MVP. And uh, initially, I personally did not think uh, that would see this autonomous AI that works without the human in the loop uh, come through. But we know that in Europe we have Oxipit that was recent, was approved this year that can just look at uh, chest X-rays. And you know. Uh, what, what this tells me is that, and this is the best time to be doing this type of work and research, is understanding what does even human-machine partnership look like. So you are uh, sort of, um, sort of you are referring provider, let's look through the radiology workflow and look at even an AI algorithm that would be used to prioritize what studies I should dictate first and what, which ones I shouldn't. So it completely removes the values that are there. And you may say, I don't care, I'm an ER doctor, I just want to have the fastest read. So in that case, for the ER doctor, speed is the utmost value. But if you're a cancer expert, then detail, and you may even want one specific radiologist to interpret your studies because you sit on tumor boards with them and you discuss these cases and you know and, and there's this trust and we, we know that this happens but all those uh, those are eroded and then I may also have trainees of different caliber and I may want to read the easier study so that they have a chance to see a rare case or you know a more complex study all those vi human values, Today, I know there's the value system design, but nothing has been done in terms of designing the values that meet the needs of the radiologists, the patients, and the referring providers. And this is an area where I think it's going to be interesting to see what comes up. So if you have an autonomous AI, 
it generates a report. We are in the era where all patients should get their reports, you know, probably now within 24 hours. What, who, when they have a question, who are they gonna call? You know, if I disagree, what, what am I going to tell the patient? And there are all these impacts that we, we, we know are coming that we haven't even started to think to, we are thinking about them, but I don't know that we even have tried to think about the scale or the burden that's going to come on, onto this human machine partnership and what a successful partnership would look like. Yeah, that's such a, a critical point about implementation and how we're not really prepared in so many ways um, as this goes forward. One of the things that uh, really strikes me, which you know has now for a series of years and, and studies is the machine eyes, machine eyes when they're trained properly with uh, the annotated images and perhaps in the future as we move more towards self-supervised learning. Uh, it's just extraordinary what machines can be trained to see and accurate in things, of course, like for example, going back to the retina, uh, how you could pick up the heart uh, artery score calcification from the retinal vessels and predict heart risk, no less than many other things, uh, you know, like kidney disease and hepatobiliary disease and Alzheimer's disease and blood pressure control, glucose control. I mean, it's almost, you need to have uh, lim no limits of imagination that what you might be able to pick up. And I think one of the striking things about this recent study you published is that it was almost unimaginable that this machines could could have eyes like this. Now, one one thing I think is really striking here is your background, because you're one of the rare physician scientists who are jointly trained in radiology, no less interventional radiology, and as a data scientist in AI. There aren't many of you in the world. <laughs> And you talk about machine eyes, you're human eyes, human eyes. You have transdisciplinary expertise, which puts you in such an unusual category to, you know, do, to do things and, and lead us. Can you help? How, how many people are there? How many physicians are there that have backgrounds like you? It's increasing, I would say so, but it's still um, not many people, uh, you know, you it's a small circle, so you kind of get to know everyone too. Um, but I think, you know, I, I think one of the things that we've seen with medical schools is quite an appetite for people who even they, when they have computer science backgrounds, you know, unfortunately medical school can kill all those other things. Or when you have other interests, people assume that you are not a good physician, you know, and, um, you know, but I think, I'm seeing at least in my pipeline, but this is also maybe biased because I tend to work with these people that we're starting to nurture some people who are coming up in this field. And then the second thing, Eric, is that maybe the, 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 you know, the change is shifting, right? That we don't really need people who can program. And, you know, because I mean, you talk about the machine eye, but if you're and this is one thing that I love to do where I'm always looking at what Google AI is coming up with, you know, their blogs or they're presenting. And it tells you, even Amazon or, or Microsoft, it tells you really, uh, if you think about their internal process, how long it takes for IP to come through, you know, if you think, if you see what they're working on it, it, and when they publish it on this, for me, it's like a, a proxy to tell me where is this field going? So trying to think that you're going to come up with a new metric, I think is false. This morning, I saw that Google AI has now broken how they're going to use chest X-ray embeddings to use just 500 images to train a COVID model. I mean, that's crazy if you think about what that means in our, in our, in our field. And, um, you know, and so, I, or, you know, recently when Amazon said, hey, why don't you come up with us? Our expertise is not to me, but you know, to the world. Our expertise is to figure out how can you inject adverts when you know at, at runtime. So this is not that I already decided that this movie should have this advert. This is like, oh, I'm seeing Eric browsing about socks. So why can I not know that he's watching this movie and inject a socks advert? I mean, just unimaginable things. So I believe that these physician scientists, one, unfortunately, are not frequently supported in the academic institutions because the clinical mission 
uh, I make generate more money for the university when I work as an interventional radiologist more than an informatician. And so I'm not supported. And so you do need to find a home that's like that to increase the number of these people. And then the second thing is there need to be new skills. And it may be that you're strong validators, you bring you know, big, big domain expertise, but you can speak to the computer scientists instead of trying to die, trying to learn the math and trying to program because validation and being able to pick up these ideas and quickly test them. I think is the most critical piece. And as we start to think about the ethical implications and this human machine collaborations, we'll need different minds more than the people that we have right now in the workforce. Dr. Gachoya, I'm just fascinated by your story. Um, as it turns out, you and I come from the same continent. I was born in Addis Ababa, not far from you in Nairobi and uh, began my medical school there before uh, the revolution and all that when my studies were interrupted. But I'm intrigued by the journey that you've taken to come to America and also reminded about the richness that international medical graduates bring. Not only are they necessary in terms of manpower, women power, but they also bring this richness that I think people don't often appreciate. But your, your, your life story certainly is a nice illustration. Talk a little bit, if you would, about your your origins and your journey to come here? Uh, thank you for, for this question. So uh, I um, was born uh, east of Nairobi. I'm the first physician in our family and, uh, you know, went to school. And so I, I was growing up when computers were new. In fact, my first computer, I bought it from the city uh, when my home did not have any electricity. So this was in high school. And you know, I'd had, uh, I had to keep it at my neighbor, my uncle's place and, you know, incentivize the, the usage by just trying to play music and movies from there. And I tell my students today that, you know, it's, it's a little bit, and this maybe is, is, is just a different mind shift. And I, 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 I probably would bet that you also have this same feeling of opportunity and gratitude, you know, of, of the, of the chances of what to you. And, uh, one of the things that if I, when I learned how to program, which was in Pascal, I had to copy all my answers from a floppy drive and then bring them and then come up with new questions and then go back to the town and pay for internet because it, it just, there was an internet and there wasn't a cell phones. And so, uh, you know, later on when I, uh, graduated from from high school you know the Kenyan way is that if you do well then you most likely will go to medical school and I was drawn to more university in in, in Western Kenya because they had this problem-based learning that allowed a lot of curiosity and so last minute I agreed and I ended up enjoying my time there and you know out of laziness would start to connect, you know, colleagues' computers so that we could exchange notes and, you know, exchange movies and, you know, just sort of any materials that we wanted, videos that we had recorded, pictures. And so, uh, you know, subsequently what happened was I ended up enjoying a lot of uh, the computers and something phenomenon was happening then. Uh, during when I was in medical school, we were grappling with the HIV pandemic. And so uh, there was a lot of emphasis on electronic medical records to try and figure out where the patients were dying. So I got involved and then pivoted to doing a lot of uh, health informatics. And so uh, later on, I would come now to the US to specialize, but I'd done quite a lot of work by then. But this was just because of uh, showing you the opportunity of mentorship, you know, and just the, the opportunity and also being at the, able to recognize that there's the opportunity when you're there. And so it's been a great, I, I've enjoyed, uh, you know, working at this intersection of medicine and technology and I've uh, had fantastic, fantastic mentors and friends and, um, you know, the cup keeps overflowing and I'm trying to pay it for. You've also worked at the NIH, and um, I wonder if you could comment about your experience with that um, uh, NIBIB. Yeah. So, um, you know, two years ago, rather 18 months ago, I got, you know, the NIH, around two years ago, the NIH was trying to, um, you know, build capacity and re, re, rejuvenate sort of like this focus on artificial intelligence and data science. And it was clear that this is my personal opinion that the NIH was behind on this, you know, ship. And 
uh, you know, if you look at most of these investments have been made by the NSF. And so one of the ways to do this was to bring experts as, you know, data scholars to the NIH to work and learn and also to, you know, sort of it's a way to maybe accelerate expertise, to learn about the NIH, bring new voices, but also allow bidirectional learning. So I had this opportunity uh, sponsored by NIBIB, but really I don't even work for NIBIB. I, I work uh, for Fogarty Center, which is uh, an investment of 75 million uh, you know, in Africa to harness data science for health. And that's been amazing because it's also the right time because this, this just got funded, we are in our first year. And, uh, you know, it's sort of merging thinking, you know, and it's, it's sort of like the amazingness of reverse innovation if you think about it. So you can, you, you can see how do you do, um, you know, multi-drug multi -drug, uh, uh, resistant surveillance in a big continent, right? How do you think about uh, genomics? How do you think about climate change? How do you think about maternal and child health? So the seven funded hubs, and I support the coordinating center and the open data science platform, trying to figure out how do we harness data science for health, building a community of data scientists, and uh, now recently, uh, working to expand partnerships and uh, work on a writing collection that's going to talk about the current data science um, status now and what it's going to be in 10 years in terms of priorities that's going to be published in nature. So it's been an, oh, an amazing, oh, oh. yeah, it's been an amazing um, experience for me. Uh, it's just, you cannot imagine sort of like, um, like how the NIH works, but also that I'm more comforted when I don't get grants. I don't take it more personally now. You know, <laughs> I realize it's, it's a tough world out there. Dr. Gucci, if you would help us think about where all this is heading. I mean, you've hinted at that in your last answer, but in terms of diagnostic radiology or radiology in general and AI, where is it all, how is it all going to unfold? You know, the I've always marveled at the fact that you would think things like echo and ultrasound would, would make us better at the bedside, better diagnosticians. But I may be the last non-cardiologist who can pick up mitral stenosis cold. Even some cardiologists would struggle with it. And you might say, well, who needs that? But how is this going to make us better physicians? I should ask you is, is, what I, is, that, is where I'm heading. I think, um, so there, there's what we see in the market. I think people are realizing that doing this work is extremely difficult. And so we're starting to see consolidation. I think more of the investments, in my opinion, are going to platforms. And this is, if you think about when we started to have EMRs being introduced in the healthcare space, that you saw a lot of people trying to lock you into their platform. And I, I think in the market, we see this a lot, right? Everyone wants you to install their platform you know, Judy platform so that I can, then I say, I'm going to distribute for you all the AI models. But if you've tried to work through such a, um, a program, you know how difficult it is that you're never gonna change the platform. So we see that type of market consolidation coming. The second area is where I think AI really has potential, but we really need to understand what it means is similar to the work that we did for the, you know, this reading grace paper, which is, these hidden signals that uh, radiologists may not really appreciate. And subsequently, uh, there's a new paper that was published that you can use this, the same models to tell you what the, um, the patient healthcare cost will be. That's actually more concerning in my opinion, because that, you know, you know I think that paper uh, shows that there's potential, you know, since we don't have enough audit tools that you know, there's potential for confounders, but if you can start to tell what the healthcare cost is from imaging alone, I think these hidden signals, you know, we've, we've done some work where we uh, showed that you can just use the chest X-ray to complete the problem list of the patient. So it's going to tell you this patient has, uh, you know, cardiomegaly or had congestive heart failure. And when you go to audit the charts, you start to find this was just a missing code. And so this population health type of, um, projects, I think will have a bigger impact because they provide opportunistic screening, they provide, you know, triage for maybe ambulatory surgeries as we start to see the work on body composition coming in, trying to tell you what's the frailty of this patient. So it's not directly that, 
it's helping you make a diagnosis. The second area, apart from population health opportunistic screening, is the area on uh, if you if you think about our triage, right? We have still fewer radiologists, uh, lots of work workload, and most of the radiologists are actually not in academia; they are in private practice, so they need to read more studies. And so we, I I, pres I would bet my money that we're going to see adoption of these AI technologies in these markets where you need to read more studies. Now I don't know how enjoyable the job would be if you're only reading complex studies because all the normal studies have been read by the AI algorithm and now your day is just full of hard studies. And then we, another thing happening in the market, I don't think we talk about a lot about this, but I think the biggest threat for radiology is not even AI, is market consolidation, this buyouts and VC money injection. And so the VCs will not, will have a very, very, very low threshold of improving productivity and output. And so when the AI tools that can do that come, and we're starting to see some of these uh, companies also buy the AI companies that are building software. And so it's going to be more market forces more than, in my opinion, more than unfortunately the immediate need for the patient that we will achieve. It's just going to be because of what's happening in the bigger space. Yeah, I mean, I think the teleradiology businesses in India and many other places are going to be machine radiology uh, businesses. And you're absolutely right. Now, before we wrap up, I did want to get your sense about bias and AI. So we, we, I think the, the, the public and the medical community tends to think there's something intrinsic wrong with AI and its bias, whereas many of the studies, uh, that even some that you touched on, the bias wasn't about the algorithm. Uh, but rather the data that was inputted that, that was terribly biased and oftentimes missed. So can you give us your view is where is the culprit and how do we try, we're never going to eradicate bias, but how, how can we improve this situation, the predicament we, we face? Yeah, I mean, everyone is putting a lot of effort on this, lots of NIH investments with the aim ahead to bring more data sets. What I would say, Eric, is that uh, I think even I have had to learn a lot more about this is that people think just because you're included that that's enough. And that's that's the, you know, I, and this is something that I hope you'll be reading soon, you know, uh, when I get my, my hands around it, it's going to be representation is not enough. Just because you include a person, that does not mean that you eliminate the bias either in the data or in the algorithm. And so uh, we start, you know, after the GFR sort of uncovering, everything is being uncovered, right? O2 saturations. I think now on July 11th, we had a paper by uh, Dr. Sally who they look at differences in oxygen supplementation. And there are also these things that are not really behaviors, but they are patterns that the models can access. For example, as an interventional radiologist, I tend to do more embolizations for GI bleeds at night, right? And we understand these sort of people, systems in our people. If you have short staff, people will say, oh, call IR in the night more than during the day when there's sufficiently staff to do endoscopy. So we're starting to see these patterns. What I worry is that maybe people will be turned off from looking at these problems. There are two things I think we should do. One is not shame and encourage sort of these uncoverings. But the second thing is like, okay, so what? Is to figure out the consequence and discuss you know, these subsequent implications. Because when you publish a paper, for example, oxygen su supplementation is different. That doesn't need to be even in an AI journal. This just needs to be that, you know, unconsciously that you're thinking about this. And so I don't know how to disseminate that, but, you know, uh, Dr. Vagis here is an expert. You know, maybe he can make that one of his next keynotes. You know, how do we communicate this in a non-threatening way to make sure that people are not, you know, shying away from uh, trying to figure out what are some of the patterns, you know, so it's an unintended consequence, but, uh, you know, the data sets, um, you know, show what's going on. The second, the final comment about this that I have is we need to put incentives for people to work on data. The funders don't fund this. Uh, we've seen some really good work, uh, you know, uh, support from the Moore Foundation, the Lacuna Fund. It's not really the mainstream uh, bodies that understand what's the importance of 
just working on good data search curation. This has been very humbling for our group for the last three years. It's a thankless job. But if you think about, if you're coming to me and saying, hey, can we collaborate on a test X-ray? It's usually convenient something. I pull the most recent test X-rays or the ones that I have somewhere already saved. You cannot really expect everything is comprehensive in that way. It's, a, it's such a pleasure to get to talk to someone like you. And I think, you know, I think whatever you're doing, please keep doing it because you clearly are uh, breaking new ground. Uh, uh, I'm delighted to have had this chance to chat with you. Yeah, I want to Rob. say, um, Judy, Dr. Katoya, you are speaking of models, um, uh, algorithmic AI models, you're a model. Okay, you're a model for uh, medicine, for the future of medicine. We're so excited to have this conversation with you, and we're going to be following your career with, you know, great interest. But uh, in so many ways, um, you're really uh, advancing the field, and you're at a young age, or you're just getting started, you know, and you have this great background that uh, is, as, as mentioned earlier, really rare. We hope to see more physicians pursue joint disciplines like you, because you start to have insights that just not going to happen when you're siloed. Um, but, uh, you know, the work that you've done, not just the one that we predominantly discussed today, is already a, a great um, uh, body of uh, effort, of contributions, and we know you're going to keep building on that. And uh, we thank you for joining us today, for the work that you're doing. That you, you hinted on some of the new stuff that's coming out soon, which is also exciting. And uh, wow, what, what's going to happen in 10 years with you? Oh, my goodness. So thanks. Thanks so much for joining us. I know all the folks uh, that tune into Medicine and Machine will really enjoy getting to meet you through this podcast. And thank you so much for the opportunity.